This is something that I read this week. The vast majority of investors with a million dollars in assets don't consider themselves wealthy. So says a survey of more than 4,000 people, all of whom had more than $250,000 in the bank, half of whom had more than a million dollars in the bank. They don't consider themselves rich. And get this, 40% of the folks who had $5 million in the bank didn't consider themselves rich. Kidding, right? No, I'm not kidding. And having just returned from Africa, <laughs> where you see how little millions of people live on, it's just amazing that these people don't consider themselves wealthy. Poverty in the United States is wealthy to billions globally in terms of material wealth. So how much does one need in the bank to consider oneself rich? Remember this. The vast majority of Americans have no savings at all. Half of us don't even have enough savings in the bank to cover three months of expenses. And you've got five million in the bank and you don't consider yourself rich. Well, when the UBS survey asked people, so what would have to happen for you to consider yourselves rich? Do you know what the number one answer was? No financial constraints on activities. That was the number one answer, which is a big shift from just seven years ago because in 2008 when they did the survey, people at that time gave them a level, a specific number like $2 million. But now it's shifted from something concrete to something fuzzy and nebulous. No constraints. Well, what this survey really suggests is whether one considers themselves rich or not depends upon whom you are comparing yourself with. And almost everyone compares themselves to people who are above them, not looking at what God has already blessed themselves with. How true God's word is that comparison is the devil's trap. We can see in our epistle lesson um, what St. Paul would think of such a conclusion. In writing to the Corinthian Christians, he, um, in collecting an offering for those who are not so fortunate in Jerusalem, St. Paul writes, for if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. You see, St. Paul isn't going to fall into this comparison trap, measuring ourselves with what others have and uh, what we think we might need. And although Paul is talking about money in this passage, he's not trying to be the Dave Ramsey of the ancient world. It's not about money, St. Paul says. It's about something bigger, something eternal. Having been snatched from the clutches of death and self-reliance and brought into God's overwhelming grace and mercy, St. Paul knew that wealth wasn't about money. Money is just a thing. It's a commodity. Richness is about the state of the heart, says St. Paul. What makes one wealthy is having the overflowing grace of God in your life. That's why when you're dealing with this text, you really got to put it in context, which is why we begin at verse 1 in the epistle lesson there. Because you see in the epistle, at the beginning there, St. Paul talks about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. True, Paul is soliciting donations for this unfortunate church in Jerusalem who was once again suffering through another famine. But money 
that money aspect is really kind of the sidebar of what's going on in this text. The Macedonian Christians have been especially generous in their offerings, even beyond their abilities, he says in verse 3. But why? Why were they able to do that? And that's what Paul is driving at in this epistle lesson. Now, Paul isn't shaming the Corinthian Christians. That's not what he's doing here. He's not trying to flatter them either. Some commentators like to say that in this text, in this section here, that Paul is kind of subtly shaming the Corinthians by comparing them to the Macedonian churches. And you could probably get that if you read just verse 8 there where it says that I'm testing the sincerity of your love in comparison to the earnestness of others. Yeah, you can get that there. But if you read verse 8 as an addendum to verse 7 in which St. Paul says, just as you excel in the gift, in everything, in the gifts of knowledge, of speech, of faith, of earnestness, of love, he's saying, so also excel in that gift of generosity. What Paul is exhorting the Corinthian church here is not it's sort of a reflection of 1 Corinthians. Don't just concentrate on a few spiritual gifts. Incorporate all spiritual gifts within the church for its use. There is not one spiritual gift that's above all the other gifts except the gift of love. What's more, in this whole passage, Paul is not goading but exhorting. His words aim at the hope and faith in which Christ has created them anew with a new desire. Like a mother mare nuzzles the foal to get up and start walking, so Paul is saying it's time for you Corinthians to stand on your own new legs. And one of the outcomes of standing in faith is generosity. Generosity is a key component of living the Christian life. So here in this text, Paul is like nuzzling, nudging the Corinthians, not goading them by comparing them to the Macedonians. In fact, you look at Paul and he's not saying compare yourself with the Macedonian churches. He is actually telling them that they need to gaze on the head of the whole church. Verse 9, For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. You see, Paul is talking, of course, about Jesus leaving the richness of heaven to walk among us as servant so that you and I might come to the richness of faith. Generosity is a divine gift. It's not something that we humans just naturally do. You don't have to teach a little child to say, mine. They learn it on their own. Generosity is born in the human heart when God comes in his spirit to humble us. Working repentance in us that says, God, I can't save myself. It's all you. You are the one who has to save me. I can't do it on my own. And once we have that humility of faith in our hearts, then and only then are we awestruck by the immense love that God has shown us. Love that, love that doesn't reject us in our sin. Love that pursues us because he wants to save us. Love that continues to pursue us daily 
because we daily sin. And in spite of our daily sin and rebellion, is still eager to forgive and renew. Our God is rich in love and grace and freely, generously pours out that grace into the world through his word, assuring us of his love in the sacraments of baptism and holy communion. By reminding us of how wealthy we are in God, St. Paul is kind of nudging and nuzzling us so that our lives reflect the God whom we serve. We serve a generous God who calls us to a life of generosity. It's no different from when we pray, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Our lives should reflect the one whom we serve. Quite often we kind of tell ourselves, though, yeah, okay, I'll be generous once I have a surplus. But waiting for a surplus is not a good approach, and it's certainly not one that is urged by St. Paul here. How many times have you heard someone say in wisdom, you know, if you wait until you can afford to have children, you'll never have them? It's sort of the same way. If you wait till you have a surplus, you'll never be generous. The undercurrent of our age is that we never have enough. The generosity that Paul has in mind here doesn't begin with surplus. It begins with a desire to follow Jesus, following Jesus as servant, having a servant's heart, loving others as Jesus has loved us. The secret to a life of contentment, according to St. Paul, is serving others. It's really that simple. You all know how often this text is used into, in, uh, in commitment times, you know, we're trying to get people to commit to a budget for the, for the church. And, but generosity is a much larger issue than that. Generosity is about real stewardship. Um, generously giving from the heart in reflection of the love that God has already poured in you. You know, and I'm a realist, you know. You know, sometimes a generous spirit can just get overwhelmed by the daily things and pressures of life. <clears throat> Peter Chin, who is a blogger on Christianity Today, um, had a story that just touched me. He was talking about one time where He had to go to the grocery store, and he hated going to the grocery store because it was always crowded. But he needed a can of chicken stock, so he went to the grocery store, went, picked the can up off the shelf, went to the front of the store, and then scanned the aisles to see which one he could get out quickest. And Oh, there's aisle four. It's for 15 items or fewer, and there's only two people in there. So he approaches that aisle and gets in line. But he realizes soon that he chose the wrong line there was a couple in front who seemed to be having trouble with his purchase, keeping him from escaping this store. He saw them, and the attendant was removing items from the belt. And Chin says, he says, I pursed my lips and I glared at that couple who had so perfectly sabotaged my exit from this purgatory. He said, I could see little of them except their dark curly hair and ill-kept clothes. Their heads were down and they were looking through their pocketbooks and all the while the attendant was removing cans from the grocery belt. Finally, he said, finally the couple shuffled away purchasing nothing, all that time and all for nothing. 
He said, I shook my head in disbelief and gave a disapproving look to them as they walked away. The man in front of him quickly made his purchase and moved on, and it wasn't long before I was uh, paying for my, uh, my uh, purchase as well. And he said, but he looked at what the couple was trying to buy and noticed that it was cans of Similac, infant formula. Chin's disdain quickly turned to shame. He had made assumptions about the couple without knowing really what was happening. And he said what was probably happening was that this couple went in to buy formula and using one of the city's programs like WIC or SNAP, and what they were trying to purchase just wasn't on the list of the approved items, whether it was the brand or the size they were trying to buy. And they didn't have enough in their own pocketbooks to buy even one can. So Chin said he quickly made his purchase and ran out the store to try to see if he could find the couple to purchase some Similac for them, but of course they were already gone. He said he went to his car and sat down in shame and thought about it. And he said it really wasn't selfishness that prevented him from helping this couple. What he said it was, was an enslavement to my own convenience. Having a servant's heart would have caused him to at least try to understand what was happening to the couple ahead of him in line, instead of viewing them as an obstacle to his own quick departure from the store. St. Paul is absolutely right in telling the Corinthians, and by extension, us, that we need to measure our generosity not against others, but against Christ, who, though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich." Rich with God's abundant mercy. Rich with overflowing grace. Rich with unending love. So that out of God's wealth given to us, we may overflow with service to others. What makes one rich? Guess it depends on who you ask and with whom you are comparing yourselves. But according to St. Paul in 2 Corinthians, you are rich if you have God's grace. Having the heart of Christ, that's what makes one rich. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.